FBI is looking into the death of a black man after he was stopped by police in Minneapolis. When I first saw the George Floyd video, I was actually in the car on my way back down from Flagstaff. And, and then honestly, it, it was a state of numbness, right? Like I had seen, I've seen it so many times. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know how to respond. Thousands came out to chant and demand a change when it comes to police mistreatment, accountability, and everyday systemic injustices that African Americans face. It's a global issue, and it's going to take the entire world working towards it to correct it. I don't have an answer for why a, a man like George Floyd had to die like that. It was barbaric in nature. It was, it was something that I never thought that I would see in my lifetime by someone that has been sworn in to protect you. Innocent black lives being lost at the hands of police brutality. You see with Breonna Taylor, and then you see now George Floyd a week ago, and it's like, I don't want this to be my normal. I grew up with a single parent in a low-income household. I was very fortunate at a young age to have someone close that gap between me and and people who have a lot of privilege. I, I was awarded a scholarship by the Bill Gates Foundation. I, I finished college with, with two undergrads, a master's, and now I've, I've spent six years with the Phoenix Suns. You know, I couldn't afford to go to NBA games as a kid, and so to be able to show up and work for one every day is really special. And so a little bit of guilt, I think, came later that week. And then the next thing I remember is actually going out to one of these local restaurants that we were supporting for coronavirus and delivering meals. And we were on our way back downtown. And this is actually the first time I had seen a protest for George Floyd. Um, we were caught in traffic anyway. The streets were shut down. And so I had turned to Anthony and said, hey, what if we took some pictures? What if we got out and took some pictures? We followed the protest and, and honestly, this first day, I wasn't a part of the protest. We were always ahead of the protest. That was probably the first time I felt a sense of, I gotta do something different, right? Like I can't just continue to come home every day and just be okay with this. And I think this is where the depression, the sadness started hitting and I couldn't figure it out. And so I think really where you saw my first instinct to, to start showing up at the protest was that. I, I think I was just looking for release. It was uncomfortable, it was weird, but, but I left feeling better, right? Like, because it was a sense of release, whether literally through myself or just the people around me that were on our side. And so uh, that was the first day that, that I felt like I, I could get back. But you know, everybody talks from that point, like what next? This is not the first black person that has died. And I hope it's the last. Hey. I've actually worked for the Phoenix Suns. It will be three years on June 19th. Juneteenth, right? And when I was watching the news one day about George Floyd and how he passed, they said children should not be watching this. I think children should definitely be watching this. At a peaceful protest, my little granddaughter she actually was one of the, the people who took the microphone and shared her thoughts on not only does her life matter, but everybody's lives matter. And it's not just important to her, to her family, but it's important to every single person. I was very proud of her. I was very proud of that little 10-year-old girl for standing up. I sent it to Jason because I felt like Jason was open enough to receive it. And um, I was so pleased that he did and that he recognized her. The reason it resonated more than anything was, was surely to see a young person at that age stand up in front of a crowd, grab a microphone and voice her beliefs on this issue and really show a, a level of leadership. I was appreciative that Ruth was willing to share that and she wasn't looking for me to do anything else with it. She just wanted to kind of say, hey look, here's something that somebody in my family and my granddaughter has done that I'm, I'm very proud of. And, and so to me that was just a really, a really powerful thing to see. And it's, it's one thing for me, a 49 year old white male, getting up and, and, and trying to motivate people to do the right thing relative to race relations. Um, probably isn't going to be anywhere near as impactful as somebody who has their whole life ahead of them that is from a, a historically disadvantaged background um, standing up and, and 
trying to push what's right. And so I, to me, it was just, it was really a, a meaningful thing. And I, you know, I was just felt obligated, frankly, to, to share it with the rest of the organization. I was very pleased that, that he accepted it and that he shared it. I really do think that her story, her video, um, and her courage will inspire many, many people. And I would like to thank you all for being here. This Black Lives Do Matter, and they matter to me. And they matter to everyone. This is good to me. There you go. There you go, girl. I'm tired of seeing that. I'm tired of watching. Uh, somebody else lose a loved one. After writing an emotional open letter over the weekend about being the change in America, Suns coach Monty Williams explaining Tuesday that idea began to form as he watched TV coverage of George Floyd's death and protests around the country with his kids. I don't have an answer for why a, a man like George Floyd had to die like that. My kids were sitting there watching and, and to see their faces. To be straight, I felt I felt a bit helpless, but I also felt like I was a bit privileged, you know, because I'm the coach, because I make the amount of money that I make and, and I can go back to my house in this gated community. I felt a bit incubated and isolated and almost felt like I was hiding a bit by being quiet. I was proud of him, number one, for his leadership during this time. It's not a great time for America right now. The, the killings, um, dealing with a pandemic, the world, you know, sort of being just, just stopped in general. And, you know, those are times as you look for leadership. Uh, normally he wouldn't, he, he doesn't say much, but this was a time that I think he just felt looking at his family, looking at his, you know, parents and people that, his grandparents, people that raised him. This was a time that he felt that he needed to speak and, and I was proud of him for doing that. I mean, there's so many things I think, you know, we, we have to recognize the pain of others and, and we're still doing that right now. Like there, there's so much pain in the black community in minority communities. And for me, I just, I felt a level of um, privilege. I felt like I, I could hide behind my status as an NBA head coach and my gated community and my finances and just write a check to some group and, and be done with it and I just felt like I was being a bit of a coward by doing that and I did not want to get you know 15 20 30 years down the line and look back on this moment which I think is a historical moment in our lifetime and look my kids in the eye and say I did nothing and so I just decided to uh, put something down on on paper and and you know had no idea what it was going to to do or what effect it was going to have but I just wanted to do something more so to try to create a better world for my children and I think that's our job as as older people is to do that and so it was a it was a bit of a process but a lot of it was it was contrived out of shock and anger and disbelief and then a call to action. The last thing, and, and I'm not great at, at any of this stuff, but I, I do believe there has to be uh, a level of love and respect for each other, especially those who are different uh, than us. Our place as an organization is to care, you know, to care about what's going on. And because I believe the only way you can support something, you have to care about it. And, and, and actions speak louder than words. You know, what does that mean? Is that support for men and women of law enforcement? Is it support for those um, citizens who feel that they have been wronged by the police? I, be, I think it's really simple. It's supporting what's right and um, standing strongly against what's wrong. And that doesn't mean that you don't love both sides. Uh, it just means that you have to hold them accountable. I'm really appreciative of the people that I've seen and a lot of the, the work that people have done. And I think it's going, going to go a long way. And it's going to be hard to continue to progress as it always is. But I think we're making steps in that direction.
allowing them allowing us to use our voice is um, something they're, they're taking a step in the right direction. Them saying we know we're behind you guys, um, we know what's going on, um, and we're, we're here to help you basically. So I think them giving us that power and it's going to you know, make players feel more comfortable speaking out, taking a knee, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, them doing that is going to um, make players feel more comfortable and make players feel like, oh, like the NBA is behind me. Soon after everything happened with George Floyd, I was able to have a conversation with our president and CEO, Jason Rowley, and present everything that we want to do both internally and externally as an organization. Honestly, he was super receptive. And his response is, we have to try. We have to try it all. We have to try to do it as best we can, and we have to try it now. You know, hearing his, his thoughts on this issue and more importantly, hearing from him what he thought were actionable steps that we could take, that's what myself as a leader, that's what you want to hear. So, because again, I don't have all the answers myself and my perspective is going to be different than Shaquin's perspective. And so it's one thing to lay out a bunch of ideas. It's another thing for individuals and the organization to execute on them. To me, as long as the organization shows the commitment, and I know Robert certainly has this commitment and he is what he's really told us to do is make sure that we are focused and that whatever it is that we do has truly identifiable outcomes. Because if, if you don't have outcomes, then you really have just kind of wasted everybody's time. You need to be able to have something you can point to at the end of the day and say, here's what we truly accomplished. I think a big part of that was observing Juneteenth. It's a holiday that the black communities have celebrated forever. Um, and so, for our organization to acknowledge that and see that, I think is a huge step in the right direction. There was a willingness these days to hold leaders accountable that didn't used to exist. You know, it's up to leaders like myself and Robert and the leaders of other organizations to really heed that um, rather than just thinking that because, you know, we're the boss that we have all the answers because I can tell you that we don't. This year, instead of having the players choose a woman who inspires them, we had them pick a cause that they were passionate about. BG and Holly Road, for their My Kicks My Cause sneakers, chose to blend a pride flag and an ally flag. So the first step of the process was just to hop on a Zoom call with BG and Holly and see what they wanted to put on their kicks. For sure, I want the double female symbol, and we could oh, nice. potentially do it the rainbow um, inequality around the whole shoe. Uh, I don't know. Like maybe the left shoe like that, and then the right shoe. We could do uh, the ally with the, okay. with the black with the, uh, with the rainbow A on it. And then we could, I don't know, potentially do with one in 10, maybe on the toe. Me and BG's hands, we are holding hands. We are standing together. I, I just want something visual of we are in this together. This shoe is, is everything. This shoe is me. Um, I'm part of the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm part of the equality movement. This, this is me in a shoe, in a nutshell, in uh, Rough Customs, uh, definitely Definitely heard my voice and produced a shoe that um, when I unboxed it, honestly, I was kind of taken away from how amazing it was. Definitely, I want to keep these, but uh, <laughs> I think I'm actually going to auction these off um, for a great cause um, and let somebody else enjoy these um, a little bit. But this shoe is going to be hard to let go of because, I mean, this, this shoe embodies me and everything that I am. I think just being here helps a lot, just continue to get better. I'm happy we have somewhere to be because you know we got renovations. I would say we are reimagining the building because you know we know it and there's a lot of great memories here. Here's the lob, they go to Barkley, he fires the shot. Another triple. And he will get it. 
designing sports venues is really about putting the fan first and making the, the game really the most important thing. You know, one of the things that happened when, when COVID happened and things started shutting down and, and it was clear there was not going to be any other NBA games in the foreseeable future in the arena, I remember the night that Robert called and said, okay, get started. Maybe the only benefit of, of COVID-19 was we got to start the construction on the arena a month early. We're going to have, I'd say, about 70% of the renovation of the arena done for next season versus originally about 50%. COVID's been a challenge for everybody. On any job site, on any construction site, safety is the most important thing. You know, sending everybody home every night safe. Um, and we're trained to do that. I think, you know, it's a credit to the team, our safety team, our trade partners and the Suns, you know, being a unified voice in kind of how we deal with COVID. I think everybody's just really excited about what this is going to mean to the city of Phoenix. It is one of the few buildings in the NBA that it's really built around basketball. And when we reopen, I believe we are going to set the standard. The Essential Travel Party uh, will start testing today. It'll be a blood draw and also nasal and throat swab. Brady sent us all a text and wants us to be at the Madhouse. Uh, to get tested for coronavirus. So today is the official first day that we have everybody back in the market, the league mandated protocol for testing for coronavirus. So if they walk in the door, they get a temperature check, they get a symptoms checklist. Everybody will be getting a PCR or a swab, whether it's a nasal swab, an oral swab, but also they are getting some antibody testing done. So it's, this is a league mandated testing protocol and today is the first day we're getting after it. Jeez, that was like invasive. <laughs> first day getting tested. Day one. Getting real all of a sudden. So like on one hand, like this good, you kind of know where you stand on like a daily basis darn near. Every other day we come in, we get tested before we get on the court. Uh, no swab and a little throat swab. Sometimes, you know, the test can be a little uncomfortable, as we all know, but the fact that we get to hear every couple of days that we don't have it or if we do take immediate action. A little deeper today than it was the other day. <laughs> It felt like I, I was in the pool and the water went up my nose. Man. <laughs> she was like, yeah. Oh my gosh. When you found out the Suns were a part in this 22 bubble, what was your initial reaction? I mean, I felt like my, my boys, I have a, you know, teenager at the house and, and my nine-year-old and anytime something remotely positive happens in their world it's always like let's go that's what they do like and that's how I felt you know when I first found out that we were gonna be in it like I said the door was just open a crack that crack um, is an opportunity for us. And I had that let's go mentality. You know, everything we want's on the other side of hard. This is not conventional. There's gonna be a lot of stuff that we gotta do, the testing, the bubble, all that stuff is just gonna be a part of our new mix. The feeling that I have is something that I had the last summer with the national team. So I think if everybody comes with the right mindset, we can surprise a lot of people because we're going to be together for a long time, 24 hours for like six weeks at least, and then we're going to make something happen. There's never really going to be an opportunity or something like this again for the rest of us in any of our careers. Like you're going to be five, six weeks isolated in an area just with your team. And it's an opportunity for all of us, you know, to really learn about each other and to really push ourselves forward to try to build something. You guys are my second family. You guys know how much I care about you. And I'm looking forward to building all of our relationships. I'm looking forward to growing our program. I'm looking forward to winning. And I cannot wait to get after it in Orlando.
planning for a season elsewhere is unknown. We've never done it before, so typically we would just take what we need for, say, three games and practice days in between that. But this time we have to think about a training camp and then practice throughout the whole season. We're moving stuff like we're moving into a new facility. Um, we're taking a far more supplies again than normal. I keep saying that, but I mean, it's a six week plus trip. So you can see we have tape. We're taking a whole lot of gloves, a whole lot of masks, and you can see we're pretty much prepared, hopefully for the entire duration. All these boxes, that's stuff we're shipping to Florida ahead of the team. We would not normally take, I would say, some of the strength and conditioning stuff. We're basically packing up our own weight room and uh, taking that along with us. Now it goes up to me, I'd bring all these guys, especially this big boy here. But stoning it above the head is probably not a good idea on that airplane. So what we do is we need to be very strategic with what we bring. So maybe not the heavy guys, but we're gonna find ways to load these guys up. All I gotta do is fill this thing full of water. And now I have resistance training, I have handles that I can load it, pressing, pulling, squatting, all sorts of different things, but it's super easy, compactable. Throw it in here. I'm just kind of going through some shoes, seeing some of the, uh, these are some new Kelly Oubre's that he designed from Converse. Here's a sneak peek of uh, Devin Booker's playoff shoes here. Of course, he's a Kobe guy. Kobe Bryant is his idol. He wants to do everything Kobe. So he's got a, three different colors of these. Got to pack up. We had a, a couple dozen balls that we were going to take with us. Because uh, being on a neutral site, you have to bring them everywhere you go. Like a normal trip, the day before, the night before, we make sure that our, our truck is completely loaded up. So we take it to the airplane and we load it up because this is stuff that we'll want pretty closely to us as soon as we land and take it straight to our rooms. Hey Lindsay, Hi, Lily. how you doing? How are you? I'm doing good. So this will just be like a normal interview. Okay. Except for you're talking to me through FaceTime. All right. How are you approaching the packing part of this uh, trip? Because five weeks minimum, right? Yeah. Potentially a couple months. How are you approaching that? What are you packing? Whew. I, I I haven't even started packing yet, and today is July second. I'll pack my Xbox because, you know, we have days where we have to quarantine, I think, when we first get there. Well, I'm definitely packing my PS4, my monitor, and my Twitch equipment to keep everybody up to date in Orlando. I could pack a ton, but who's going to carry all that? I know I'm already going to have to be carrying other people's stuff, rookie duties, you know. I'm not fully out of rookie year yet. I'm definitely taking my golf clubs. That's number one. That's going with me. I got a few of my fishing lures and... I'm taking a couple of rods with me. If I'm going to Orlando for two months, I'm for sure bringing some books. So I bring two books. Usually I, eat, I read um, in two different languages and then go back and forth. So I... I'm a gamer. And when I get to Orlando, and I'm now on that court and we're quarantined, this is going to be my best friend. Of course, the Switch. Because Mario Kart is my favorite game. Figuring out what to pack, how to pack, and how to do it efficiently is definitely an upcoming challenge for us. Can't wait to get to Orlando, man. See you guys there. I think it'll be a great summer for us, you know. We worked pretty hard last two months, and I think the team is ready to Make proud of some fans. What does this box and me have in common? <laughs> We're ripped! <laughs> About 9 o'clock this morning, get there in the afternoon, quarantine for a couple days, we'll be ready to go. And it's the last of the rookie duties right here, hopefully. Oh yeah. We back in business. What are we getting ourselves into here, man? What was good? Hey, 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 good morning to you, bro. I said, what's up? Good morning to you. And we've come Orlando. We're finally there. 